I'm from Anna Lang's lab at UNSW Sydney in Australia. And today I'm going to tell you a bit about the work I do on model protocells or model primitive cells. So I'm sure many of us here are trying to answer the question of how did life on Earth begin? Now I'm focusing on a very, very specific point in time when life had maybe begun to transition from super simple primitive cells, perhaps composed of a fatty acid bilayer membrane, to more complex protocells or primitive cells more akin to modern biology. At this point in time, we'd started to see the emergence of phospholipids and some simple enzymes, but we hadn't yet seen, thanks, <laughs> but we hadn't yet seen uh, the emergence of all the complex cellular, cellular machinery that exists in our cells. So things like membrane transport mechanisms, for example, that transport nutrients and waste molecules out of the cell, maybe they hadn't come around yet. So that begs the question, how were these protocells actually able to feed themselves? How were they able to grow? How were they able to divide? So I'm trying to answer this question by building a propagating synthetic cell. What that basically means is it's an artificial cell that is able to feed itself, can grow, it can divide. And I'm trying to achieve this using the simplest components possible to try and understand how life transitioned into what we know it as today. So this involves a pretty large collaboration and uh, with my collaborator in Japan, Yutetsu, he's been able to build a preliminary synthetic cell composed of a phospholipid bilayer membrane, also known as a vesicle. And this vesicle is composed of a mixture of POPC and POPG, two types of phospholipids. And within this vesicle, we have a system that can be used to actually synthesize fatty acids and eventually synthesize phospholipids that can then be incorporated into the bilayer membrane, actually allowing it to grow. Now, one of the big problems with this system is that you can only encapsulate a small number of nutrients actually within the synthetic cell, within the vesicle. There's only room for so many molecules. And if you encapsulate as many as you can, you only really get one to 2% membrane growth, which isn't really sustainable for a cell that we wanna make grow and divide. So, what we really need is some sort of regular nutrient supply. So we need an external feedstock of nutrients that can actually permeate the lipid bilayer membrane to make its way from the outside of the cell into to the inside of the cell. That way we can actually achieve continual membrane growth. So that's my role in this project. I'm trying to figure out a way that we can actually get the nutrients that we need for the synthetic cell to function to make its way across the lipid bilayer membrane to the interior of the synthetic cell. So in order to do that, I've needed a technique that can be used to monitor solute permeability or the permeability of different nutrients. And to do that, I'm using what's known as a shrink swell assay. Basically, that involves preparing vesicles, encapsulating a fluorescent dye known as calcine. When you mix these vesicles with your solute or your nutrient of interest, uh, the difference in osmolarity actually causes the vesicles to shrink because water rapidly exits the vesicle, and we kind of see this, these shriveled up, sort of shrunken structures. And because we've had water exit the vesicles, we've actually had an increase in concentration of the dye that's on the inside of these vesicles, and that actually causes the fluorescence signal to decrease because calcine is a self-quenching dye above certain concentrations. So at high concentrations, the fluorescence actually goes down rather than going up, so it's a little bit counterintuitive. But over time, if we have a, a permeable solute, so a solute that does actually enter the vesicle, we'll start to see the vesicle slowly swell up again and it'll roughly get back to its original size. And with that, we have a decrease in calcium concentration. So we have an increase in the fluorescence roughly to what it was to begin with. And we can basically monitor that whole process using some sort of fluorimeter or something that can measure fluorescence. And we can monitor the changes in intensity over time. So we can see initially the intensity is somewhere up here, and then with the addition of the solute, the intensity drops down. And then if we have a permeable solute, that signal will start to recover and we start to see uh, the original intensity kind of values there. Now, because these intensities are kind of a direct measure of the calcine concentration, uh, we can convert concentration to volume. So the plots I'll be showing you today um, show the changes in volume over time. And it's just worth noting that the initial stage where the vesicles shrink and swivel up, uh, shrivel up actually happens very quickly. And the experimental setup I currently have, I can't actually see that because it just happens too fast. So the data I'll be showing you is just the recovery of that volume. So the basic workflow for a lot of my experiments is to first prepare the vesicles composed of an equal mixture of POPC, POPG, 
in 50 millimolar heavy, so that's just the buffer. Um, it's roughly buffering around physiological pH. And these vesicles all, enca all encapsulate that fluorescent dye known as calcine. And then make sure all the unencapsulated calcine is removed and I mix the vesicles with the solute or the nutrient of in interest and monitor the changes in fluorescence over time and then determine the changes in volume over time. So this is what some of the data looks like. On the left, we can see some examples of some permeable solutes. So our control here was the 50 millimolar HEFIs in the blue, and all of this data is normalized to the volume of that control at time zero. So we see in the blue, the 50 millimolar HEFIs, it's just a flat line there, not much is changing, and that's what we'd expect. It's our control, it's what we made our vesicles in, so we don't expect any volume change there. But when we mix our vesicles with something like glucose or glycine, glycine, for example, so the red and the purple, we see that characteristic curve telling us that the volume is actually increasing after the vesicles initially kind of shriveled up. So that tells us that these two solutes are both permeable across these lipid bilayer membranes, and glycine is actually more permeable than the glucose because it increases at a faster rate. On that plot, I also have glycerol. Um, at first glance, it kind of looks like nothing happens there, but glycerol is known to be super permeable across lipid bilayers. So it's likely that I just actually missed that initial shrinkage and swelling stage. So it just looks like nothing's happened right now because I've missed the first kind of couple minutes of this process. Now on the other plot, we have some examples of some impermeable solutes and you can see there's quite a few there. So a lot of the solutes I've looked at so far are quite impermeable and that's, uh, we can see that there's like those flat lines at the bottom there. There's no increase in volume over time. So over this, this time frame, none of these solutes are permeable, which is kind of disappointing because a lot of these solutes would be useful nutrients for a synthetic cell. Things like AMP, ATP, uh, for energy, and then something like sodium acetate I was hoping to use as a carbon source to actually synthesize fatty acids and then the phospholipids. But it's not particularly surprising that a lot of these solutes were impermeable. Um, it's relatively well established in literature that phospholipid bilayers aren't the most permeable things, especially when comparing them to a fatty acid bilayer, for example. So fatty acid bilayers are kind of useful to think about because they have been proposed uh, to have made up the first protocell membranes before we saw the emergence of phospholipids. And we can see in this plot here for something like glucose, it's a bit less permeable in phospholipids than in fatty acid bilayers. For something like sodium potassium, it's significantly less permeable. And like over this scale, that, that's a really significant margin there. And then for something like AMP and uh, magnesium, uh, that's not actually on the scale shown here for phospholipids, so it's way less permeable in phospholipid membranes than it is in fatty acid membranes. So again, these results aren't particularly surprising, but I still wanted to try and find a way to actually get these nutrients to permeate the bilayer. So I've, today I'm going to talk about a couple of different strategies I've tried to use to actually improve permeability, the first of which is modifying the membrane composition. So as I've said, all the vesicles I've been working with so far have, comp have been uh, composed of POPC and POPG. Now these lipids are quite nice to work with. They're cylindrical in shape, so they pack together in these really nice bilayers. They're very uniform. But what would happen if I were to say, disrupt the way the lipid molecules actually pack together? What if I introduced a lipid with a different shape? Uh, something like lysopc, which has a single carbon chain rather than two, but it still has a relatively bulky head group, so it has this more conical-like shape. And when that gets inserted into bilayers, it can cause defects to form and pores, which would potentially allow nutrients to pass through the membrane. So I wanted to explore what effect adding small quantities of lysopc would have on permeability. And the other lipid I looked at is oleic acid, which is a fatty acid, has a single carbon chain and a relatively small head group, but because it's a fatty acid, it has very different properties to what phospholipids do. So I wanted to explore how those different properties might affect the permeability of the membrane. And generally, I found that they didn't make much of a difference. So first of all, I prepared all the vesicles uh, the same way I did before, but added about 10% either lysopc or oleic acid to the system. And generally, yeah, as I said, didn't make much of a difference. Um, we have one of our example permeable solutes there, so glucose, which we saw was permeable earlier. We can see in those three curves, there isn't really much difference between them. If anything, the green curve, the oleic acid has shifted down slightly, but the shapes of the curves are all very similar, which is telling us that the permeability hasn't really changed. 
And we see something simple, similar with one of the impermeable solutes, that being lysine. We still have all those flat lines, so we saw no improvement in permeability there. And this was generally the case across a lot of the different solutes or nutrients that I actually tried. There weren't any marked improvements in permeability, except for when I tried sodium acetate. So when we had the presence of 10% oleic acid in the system, we see a significant improvement in permeability compared to what it was originally with the POPC, POBG system, and also compared to adding the 10% lysopc. So we do see that curve that's telling us that the vesicle is swelling up again, and we actually have the solute molecules permeating into the vesicle, um, which is good news. Uh, we saw that one of these uh, solutes actually kind of worked and actually were able to permeate the membrane. And as I said, um, it was great to see that it did work with sodium acetate because we wanted to use that as our carbon source for fatty acid syn synthesis, then phospholipid synthesis, and that would actually help getting the membrane to grow. But as I said, overall, it didn't work for a lot of the stuff I tried. So I wanted to try a second strategy to try, try and improve permeability. And that was through the addition of divalent cations. So in literature, it's pretty well established that divalent cations also affect the packing of the, way, uh, of the lipid molecules, so the way the bilayers actually pack together. So I wanted to see if that would make a difference to permeability. And again, generally, I found it didn't make that much of a difference, except for the presence of uh, sodium acetate. So with the 10% oleic acid system and the sodium acetate, when I added magnesium chloride, which is what we see in the orange, there was an improvement in permeability. If you see that curve kind of increases faster than what the, the blue line, which is just the pure sodium acetate, and the green line, which is just the magnesium chloride. So for whatever reason, the addition of magnesium chloride with the sodium acetate and in the 10% oleic acid system did improve permeability overall. But again, generally, uh, I found that this was quite difficult to achieve in a lot of the solutes I tried. I've also tried other divalent cations, which I haven't shown here. Um, in general, it was pretty tough. <laughs> so what does that mean overall? So generally, I found that permeability can somewhat be modulated for specific, specific solutes by changing the membrane composition, and divalent cations can somewhat improve the permeability of specific solutes. But overall, it was pretty difficult to actually see any marked improvements in permeability for a lot of the different things I studied. So what does that mean for origins of life? Well, perhaps we needed protein channels to actually co-evolve with phospholipid synthesis. As I mentioned earlier, fatty acid membranes are much more permeable than phospholipid membranes. So if they were the first protocell membranes, uh, they were able to access nutrients a lot easier than phospholipid membranes on their own would be able to. So we probably needed some sort of mechanism to actually co-evolve with phospholipids as they started to emerge. But uh, this is a very much an ongoing project. I'm trying a lot of different membrane compositions, a lot of different divalent cations, and I'm still working on other methods to kind of improve permeability. So hopefully in the future, I'll have some more definitive results with um, some improvements in permeability for a lot of other solutes too. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the entire Wang group and my supervisor, Anna, for all their support. Thank you to my sources of funding and thank you to everyone for listening. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bolaga from Hawaii University. I study molecular biology. I'm just interested in the method that you use to measure your membrane permeability. Is it a um, patch clamp electrophysiology or what? So the technique I was using, it's known as a calcine shrink swell assay. Basically, it's not a direct measure of permeability. It's actually a measure of the changes in volume, but it's reliant on the fact that with those changes in volume, they can only occur because the solute is actually permeating the membrane. Um, so it's actually a fluorescence-based technique. So I use a, fluor a fluorometer or a plate reader, depending on the experimental setup I have going, to actually measure those changes in fluorescence over time. And from that, you can calculate the changes in volume, which you can actually then go on to work out permeability coefficients from those curves, which is something I haven't done yet. But you can actually fit a model to that curve and extract the permeability coefficients as well. OK, um, I'm, I'm just actually thinking that um, if you can employ the patch clamp electrophysiology method, it's going to give insight into
like membrane polarity, hyperpolarization, yeah. which can also give more insight on this. Yeah, 100%. And there's a few other techniques that I've actually used as well that are quite similar to that, but I, I didn't show them in this presentation, but I'm happy to chat about them more after if you're interested. Hi, I'm Tim from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I was wondering, uh, it, do you think there could be an effect of physical size or specifically surface area uh, on the degree of permeability? And if so, did you like control for size? Did you extrude your vesicles? Somehow? I sure did. Good question. Yeah, so these vesicles for, for this system I'm working with have all been extruded through 50 nanometer pores. Um, they're roughly, uh, they're probably about 40 nanometers in diameter. Um, for the most part, uh, it's a relatively even distribution. Um, I did do DLS on pretty similar systems. Um, yeah, but uh, that's why I did extrude, because I would expect permeability to be affected by the size of the vesicles. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you.